folks, lovely to see you here tonight, thanks for coming. For those who don't know me, I'm Bert Kergill, I live in Kirkwood. I'm Holborn, they've asked me to come along for a couple of weeks and explore with you one of my favourite topics, the interaction between science and the Christian faith. This is the first of eight lectures, as you probably know. I hope you will come back. I hope you're not so bored tonight to say no that I won't be back again. I'll try and make it interesting for you. I'll try and make it exciting for you. I'll try and make it challenging as well, because the debate or the argument or the alleged antagonism between science and the Christian faith is maybe 250 years old, but it's still active. It's still of interest to some people. Not everyone, though. Some people find science is too difficult and dull and boring. Before I get stuck in, I have a couple of things to say. There will be tea or coffee and refreshments at the end. If you have any questions to ask, as I'm sure you may well have, because this is a complex area. If you have any questions to ask, then at the end you can either do it face to face. I'd rather write a question down and hand it to me. Deal with questions later in the week. There'll be an opportunity for that. So please don't feel inhibited. Let's have your interaction in that matter as well. In addition to that, from literature, some of it has been already provided by the folks who meet here in Holborn Hall. One or two others are books and booklets that I've provided because I happen to be the author of them. And if you're really interested in what I've got to say, I could recommend that you take some or other of these away with you and see if you can learn a bit more about this exciting topic. Are we created? Are we evolved? Right, let's get going and see where we get to. I think I'll choose to stay here and talk rather than go away up there. And so we are wondering about the universe. Was it created? Did it evolve? We're wondering about things that we see all around us. Are they created or did they evolve? We're wondering about other things that we sometimes encounter. Were they created or did they evolve? That big question needs an answer. Let's see if we can explore some of the ideas behind these two things tonight. First thing I want to say is have a look at what actually science tells us. What does science say in this debate about the question of whether we are created or not? To begin with, we need to define our terms and ask yourself, now, what is science? Here's my idea of what science is. It's a system of knowledge derived from observation, measurement and experiment. It investigates material things. It investigates the physical universe. It has a powerful influence in everyday life. Most of us wouldn't have managed to be along at Holborn Gospel Hall tonight if it were not for the application of science. Most of us owe the kind of health care we receive gladly to the application of science. It has huge, huge influence, huge benefits, but also huge risks that I'm sure some of you are aware of. 
But science cannot answer every question you might ask. Let me explain. Science cannot answer what it cannot measure, because science is all about measuring things. So, for example, science cannot tell you if a sunset is beautiful. Science cannot tell you what beauty is, and yet that's important to a lot of us, isn't it? Science can't tell you if it's okay to cheat at games, whatever your favourite sport might be. You kind of have an inward feeling that it's wrong to cheat. Science doesn't tell you that. And in commerce, well, some people get the wrong side of the law for cheating at commerce, and science has nothing to do with that. What should nuclear power be used for is a big debate. And although science is behind the application of nuclear power, science cannot tell you what it should or should not be used for. Should it be used for medicine? Should it be used for generating power? Should it be used for making explosives? All of these are possibilities and science can't tell you which. Which is right, which is wrong. That's out with the realm of science. Nor can science answer this important question, why am I here? I don't mean here in this particular auditorium, I mean here on earth. Where did I and indeed my ancestors come from? Science can't tell you that. And science can't tell you either what will happen after you die. So while science is extremely useful and to many people very interesting, it's not able to answer all our questions. I must tell you the answer to this one. Does God exist? Science can't answer that one. Here's all the Here are here are questions for science. Here are the kind of questions that science can answer. For example, does sugar dissolve in water? Well, you don't need science to answer that because you know that if you take a teaspoon of sugar and pop it in a glass of water, it dissolves. But, unconsciously, you're doing what science does. You're testing it, you're trying it, you're experimenting to find out. So science can tell you about the solubility of sugar in water, whereas chalk in water wouldn't do the same. Science can tell you whether or not the sun goes around the earth. Because if you're a naive observer, you think actually, um, is it that way or is it the earth that goes around the sun? Science can tell you which. Science can tell you what the speed of light is. One of the great fundamental constants of the universe, the speed of light, and it's very, very fast. Science can tell you whether or not matter is made of atoms. Not so easy to do that. Relatively easy to do the first three things, but this one is not so easy to do, but nevertheless, by a series of experiments and inferences and measurements, scientists have come to the firm conclusion that everything is made of atoms, tiny, wee, small things, so small that it's almost impossible to imagine. Science tries to answer this question, is everything the result of evolution? It can't give you some answers. And if you're left with a question like that last one, you've got to say to yourself, well, what are the evidences of this? What experiments can we do to test the idea? And are there any alternatives to the question, to the answer that we have? Well, in respect to that last question, are we here as a, as a result of evolution? Some scientists say, that everything did gradually change, or their word is evolve, by what's called natural selection, by the processes of nature, over billions of years, going back through countless ancestors to more and more simple organisms, and then to the initiation of life itself, and then to the origin of the universe and its components, and then we're stuck. Where do we go from there? So anyway, some scientists say that we are here, that the living natural world that we here tonight are a result of evolution, unplanned, completely by chance. And this is indeed a very popular belief. So, created or evolved is the question.
question. Sometimes I have to say.
But nobody has yet ever observed or ever hoped to observe the evolution of a dog into a donkey. So microevolution is a fact within a species. The macro, the big evolution, is a proposal, the theory. And it's that one that I'm talking about tonight. The theory that all species have evolved from a common ancestor over millions of years, tracing back and back and back to the beginning, whenever that was. The big question is, can we extrapolate from number one to number two, from the observed things? Can we say what happens within the species is what happens across the species? This word, extrapolation, is a word that scientists use a lot. And because it's so important, I want to take a few minutes to explain it and to show both how it works and when it doesn't. Many of you at school were taught that when you heat a steel rod, it expands. I don't know how old your knowledge is of the railways, but if you're as old as me, you'll remember that the railways in the early days, when the trains went over, then they went click and clack, because they went over tiny gaps between lengths of rail to allow for the summer and winter expansion and contraction of the said steel. So here's an experiment in which somebody has set out, a scientist has set out to do some experiments to actually measure the length of a steel rod up the left-hand axis against the temperature along the bottom axis. And uniformly, as the temperature increases from room temperature up to, say, 600 degrees C, the steel expands uniformly. And if you're clever and know enough maths, you can get a wee mathematical equation that will tell you what it is. Those geniuses in the front row who know their maths will know the equation is y equals mx plus c. Anyway, you say, well, I want to know what happens when the temperature is higher than 600 degrees C. So I'll get an experiment set up whereby I can extend the range. And I'm going to assume that the line continues straight in the way it was doing, so that at 1,000 degrees C, the length will be where the new X is on the overhead. And then somebody enables you to actually test that, and you find, yes, that's true. So the law of expansion holds up to 1,000 degrees C. And you say, well, I'd really like to know what happens when it gets even hotter when I want to go to 2200 degrees C, I want to extrapolate. And so I draw the line, a straight line. And now I think I know what length this bit of steel will be at 2200 degrees C. And then suddenly somebody says, well, you should go and test that. You should try it. So you get some apparatus that can heat above the temperature you've been at. And you try it. And here's what happens. It actually melts. So a new law has taken over. The law of expansion of steel is valid between room temperature and 1500 degrees C, but you cannot extrapolate beyond it because a new law takes over, the steel melts. So what I'm saying is that extrapolation is fine when we're talking about a steel rod within certain temperature limits. And that's not the only example. There are many well-known examples. Youngsters grow <coughs> from the age of one to approximately the age of 17. There is a steady growth in every boy and girl who is born. But you don't keep growing after you're 17. There's some of us that be through the roof. A new law takes over. A plane on the ground is obeying the law of gravity. How does it manage to get into the air? Because once it gets airborne, it's obeying new laws called the laws of aerodynamics. Another law takes over. You cannot always extrapolate. You can do it under certain conditions, but not every time. And from the visible dimensions of ordinary objects to inside atomic and nuclear dimensions, do the same rules apply? No, they don't. And from the present that we observe to the past that we can't access, 
and to the future that we can't access, can we extrapolate? Can we say what's happening now is what's always happened in the past? Hundred years? Thousand years? Oh, wait a minute, evolution takes us back millions and millions of years. Can we extrapolate back as far as that? And what about the future? Well, the Bible says we don't know what a day may bring forth. And to try to extrapolate uniformly from what is happening today into millennia yet to come is dangerous. Might not work. So extrapolation, yes, is useful, but not always correct. And my point is that you cannot necessarily extrapolate from what happens within a species to what happens across different species. And in one of my lectures, I want to take this point up very seriously because it is a serious one. I'll hint at it tonight and develop it later. The while evolution does take place within a species, there are very good reasons why it will not take place across a species. So much then for extrapolation. The main point is that different rules can apply in different areas of knowledge. Extrapolation means that true here is not always true there. It becomes less reliable the further you go from measured reality. It becomes doubtful, it becomes wrong, and the further away you go, the more chance it is of being wrong. Out into space, beyond the solar system. We hardly know for sure all that's happening within the solar system. Even with the advent of space stations, and telescopes sent deep into the space, the dimensions of space are so vast that we can't really be absolutely sure what, what applies within the area we know will apply billions of light years away, and indeed back in time for billions of years. Nor is it possible to extrapolate from the scientific realm into behavioral, moral, and spiritual areas different rules may apply. The big one I'm really thinking about tonight is, is it possible to extrapolate across the boundaries of species? Because that is the keystone of the big evolution theory. Are we created? Are we evolved? What does science say? Science says you can make individual species change, but they can't say species. There's no dog. Still cats, still donkeys. But you cannot change a dog into a cat, nor into a donkey. And across the boundaries of species, evolution is saying it depends on this. But science says, not only not necessarily, but I hope to convince you tonight, science is saying no, not really. So let's have a look. Let me take up again this idea of adaptation within species, the observed one, what happens that we can see. This is a real observed change in some living thing, let's say a butterfly. And it happens for two reasons. Number one, to survive. Natural selection, in other words, the process of weeding out creatures which are less able to survive, is what has caused changes within species over generations. The other way in which adaptation will be seen is by crossbreeding within individual species. This is something that I've referred to already and something that's well known, that within species you can do this, but the limits are fixed by the limits of the species. Let's think about this selective breeding thing. You can get different varieties of wheat, or of roses, or of sweet peas, or whatever it is your favourite plant might be, by cross-pollination. You can get and pollinate apples, so that you can cross-pollinate wheat and roses and so on, no, but you can pollinate apples by plant. You can get different types of animals by cross-breeding. Take different ancestors, take different characteristics that are there, and emphasize them by cross-breeding. But you again are confronted with a limitation. 
even to very closely related species, a horse and an oki, you can make them mate, and the offspring will be a mule. And you then say, that's fine, I've got a mule, I've got another mule, and they'll make them, we'll get more baby mules. No, you don't. Mules are sterile. Their breeding potential is cut off by whatever has happened within the genetic code of the animal. So yes, cross-pollination will give you different types of plant. Cross-breeding will give you different types of animal, but only within the species boundary. Evolution theory does not explain all the facts in many of the areas that's proposed. If you read about evolution, you will find phrases like these. We do not know how such and such happened. We may believe that such and such a thing happened. We propose, we suppose, we imagine. In evolution theory, there are some basic facts built on in the real experimental area within species. But trying to take that outside of the species, across species, you need some imagination. The next point I want to mention tonight is that evolution is actually contradicted by several established laws of science. That's why I've called my first lecture, What Does Science Say? Well, let's think about this business about laws of science, because this is something you don't have to hear about. So let's go for it. Think about the laws of science. Well, there's several. Here's one that we all have to obey, whether we like it or not. It's called the first law of thermodynamics. Now that word thermodynamics means it's got energy and work. And this says quite simply that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Sometimes called the conservation of energy principle that again some of you folk not long at the school have heard of. So, if the law of thermodynamics is always obeyed, evolution theory is a problem. Because evolution theory needs something to work on. There is not only a huge amount of material in the universe, living and non-living, but there's a huge amount of energy in the universe. Where did it come from if the whole thing is totally subject to the law of thermodynamics? Well, some people say, oh, okay, it was always there. Energy, matter, is eternal. Never at the beginning, never will have an end. There's a good reason to dispute that, because nowadays many people believe in the so-called Big Bang. Now, I don't actually believe in the Big Bang as it's sold, but the Big Bang does tell you something. The Big Bang does tell you that energy and matter had a beginning. <coughs> I don't think the beginning is quite how people describe it in the Big Bang theory. Because if there was a big bang, you need to say, well, what caused it? Where did it come from? Because it needs energy. It needs material. My best proposal is that this energy, this material, was put into the universe by someone outside of it. The person I prefer to call Almighty God. So the first law of thermodynamics creates a problem for evolution theory. The first law of thermodynamics points to a creator who outside of the universe exists and has the resources and has the intuition and the ability and the wisdom and the strength to put it there. A bit further, the second law of thermodynamics. This one is not so easy to describe, but it really says that in all processes that occur on their own, there's the thing called entropy that increases. Now, although entropy is a funny word, it's really an everyday experience. It means untidiness, it means chaos. And you youngsters will still be sure that if your parents say to you some evening, come on, tidy up your room, it won't tidy itself up without you doing something. And the fact that it gets untidy on its own is just the second law of thermodynamics at work. The entropy of a youngster's bedroom, the entropy of your father's desk 
and your mother's kitchen. Increase his naturally to tidy it up that it won't happen on its own. You need to do something to make it happen. The things that happen on their own without outside effort are the key behind this second law of thermodynamics. So processes occur naturally without any outside input from any other force or influence. The processes which occur naturally are those which give products that are more disordered, more chaotic than the starting materials, not the other way around. Simple material things, simple systems do not become more complex if they're left on their own. And yet this is again one of the keystones of evolution theory. That simple things, simple structures, simple molecules became more complex. Simple creatures became more complex on their own without anybody doing anything. The second law of thermodynamics says no, that does not happen. <coughs> so I think the second law of thermodynamics points you in a different direction. It says that somebody created them complete. And that somebody, in my view, is God. Let's look at these natural processes, because this is an important thing. Natural process, things that happen on their own. Not from far from where I live, there's a ruined castle. It was built there in the year 1650. And by the year 1950, when I began to take notice of things, it was more or less like that. Over the years, with nobody doing anything to it, it became more disordered. The stones that somebody had carefully cemented into position eventually fell down. And there is a heap of masonry beneath that once tower, which illustrates that what happens naturally is not for things to build up on their own. A pile of bricks doesn't suddenly become a house by just waiting for it to happen. What happens naturally is a breakdown because the broken down stage is more stable. Now let's apply that to the area of biology. Biological systems are made up of very complex molecules called proteins. Left on their own, they degrade into simple components without anybody doing anything to them. That's what happens. For example, if you were to take a piece of choice T-bone steak. You get on another day, don't you? Um, and leave it outside, protected from scavenging dogs. You get them another day too, don't you? And just watch what happened. It would degrade into smelly things to begin with, and eventually degrade the simple molecules. The simple molecules would not build up to complex proteins. And that's an example of what happened. But evolution says, no, no, it was the other way around. The simple molecules became big complex ones, and the big complex protein molecules joined together to give you whatever. So this law of thermodynamics is another pointer to the falsehood of evolution theory. Because this process that we observe happening if we can wait long enough, is the very reverse of what evolution requires. There's a third law. It's called the law of biogenesis. It's just the law of life. It says something that we all know, that dead things never, cannot produce living ones. It's easy, relatively easy, for living things to become dead. But naturally speaking, it is impossible for anything that's dead to become alive. Living things can only be derived from other living things. That is the law of biogenesis. And so because life is such a huge issue in the living world, including ourselves, the law of biogenesis makes it difficult to say life just happened somewhere, sometime, in some distant planet or on this planet. You know, I said earlier, people say, we may suppose that, we think that, without any evidence for it. But the evidence against life just beginning on its own is very strong.
and life really has to come from a non-natural source. And the best non-natural source that I know of that could produce life is Almighty God. Here's another set of laws that give evolution a hard time, the laws of information. This is a relatively new area of science, <coughs> brought about perhaps most recently by people's interest in technology and information technology at that. The laws of information. Now, we don't always think about that, but every living thing, you and I sitting here, are loaded with information. I don't mean in our brains the things we remember, but every cell in our body and every cell in every living thing is loaded with information which tells the DNA within the cell what to do next. So the information is all around us. Where did it come from? Well, the laws of information say, first of all, it requires an intelligent source. Information doesn't just come about from nowhere, from nothing. It only comes from a previous intelligent source. Information is communicated by a code or a language. The source of the information and the receptor of the information must use the same code or language. The information is not a material thing, but its storage and its transmission uses material. All information, of which the universe is packed full, originated in some supreme intelligence, which again I would need to call God. But let me go back for a minute and just make this point to you. Here you are tonight, and I'm trying to communicate information to you. The information that I'm trying to give you is stored somewhere up here. It's not coming out of thin air. The information you're receiving as a source. I'm communicating that information to you by a code. In other words, I'm speaking my best English, albeit with a thick accent and a North East accent. But you can understand that, you can cope with that, can't you? We're using the same code. We're using the same information code. And this information is not a material thing. The transmission of the information is material. They tell me that what is happening is the sounds I'm making in my voice box are making vibrations in the air of this room which your ears pick up. And with the tiny sensitive hairs in your eardrums they go to your brain and you get the information that started off in my brain. But information doesn't come from nowhere. And in this universe, which is full of information, all information began with the source of the best and most information you can get began with Almighty God. Well, let's go back to our original point. What does science say about this big debate? Evolved or created? Science is based on cause and effect. We observe the effects. The big effect is that the universe is here. Science says, here's the universe, we're looking at it, we're examining it. But science says, what's the cause of that? What's the cause of that? Science measures things. Measures them in terms of three fundamental properties. Mass, length, time. And from these measurements you get facts. Once the facts are clearly established, scientists then try to understand them, and they propose ideas. They come up with theories. They extrapolate from what they see to what they would like to go into further. And the theories that then are discovered and proposed have to be tested, tested by an experiment. All right, to dream something up, but it might be a load of rubbish. And theories are only verified by experiments. And after all that's done, you come to the realm of laws of science. Laws are obeyed. They describe what happens clearly. And because the laws of science are obeyed, we live in a predictable environment. We know 
that what happens will happen because we live in a universe, we live in a world where natural laws are obeyed. A big example would be if you went down to the harbour and watched the tide coming in and going out. The coming and going of the tide can be predicted for decades to come because the laws of the universe are uniform. The laws of science are always obeyed. But I'm trying to tell you tonight that the laws of science prohibit evolution in the big realm. And nobody hardly blinks when they say, well, even though the laws of science are there, and science says that life doesn't come from dead things, evolution says, well, okay, we know that, but we'll just assume that it happened. We'll break the law for once. And when evolutionists say, well, simple things evolved into more complex ones, and they recognize there's this second law of thermodynamics, this entropy law that says, no, it's the other way around. They say, well, yes, we know it is, but we want this to happen anyway, so we will assume, we will propose that things evolved and got bigger and better. What science says is that creation is much more logical. Creation is much more scientific. That is evolution. Nobody tells you that much these days. Laws are never broken in science. No exceptions are allowed. For example, you can't stumble off the top of a cliff and say, please don't let the law of gravity apply in this instance. No chance the law of gravity applies. Scientific laws are not broken. The law must explain all the facts, and evolution is not supported by the laws of science. These natural laws, then, discovered by scientific observation, never broken, we've no choice in the matter, and because they're never broken, we have a reliable and ordered environment to live in. They prohibit the evolution of everything from nothing. They prohibit the evolution of complex things from simple ones. They're there. But if you take the view that someone outside of the universe created the universe, created matter, energy, life and all, then science studies that. And the laws of science describe how everything works after it's been created. And after time is passing, these laws are still being obeyed. The laws of science point firmly to a creator. So to finish, so let's digress a little bit. Because as well as scientific or natural laws, we know that we live in a society that has what you might call moral laws, which are introduced by governments and the like for the good of the people of a given society. Here's a familiar example. If there were no speed limits, if there were no traffic lights, if there were no laws about how one ought to drive one's car, Notice I didn't say how you want to drive your car. If there were no laws about driving, what chaos would be on the roads? What carnage would be on the roads? Moral laws, as I'm calling them, are put there for a good reason. They are for everybody's good. Not necessarily your personal good. You're maybe in a hurry, you think. And you'll maybe cut 30 seconds of your journey by going at 35 miles an hour. As if 35 seconds is worth that. Motivated by our conscience, when we see that red circle with the number in it, we kind of notice it. Hopefully, he did. But, come on, who's never broken it? I won't say put up your hand because that would be embarrassing. Laws, moral laws, unlike natural laws, unlike the law of gravity, you can't break that, but you can break moral laws. And, what's more, the consequences of moral laws would be total chaos. And, what's more, the consequences of breaking moral laws can lead to personal loss. What do I mean? They can lead. Choices are ours. We can choose to obey these laws.
was or not. Faced with the possibility of some penalty, of some loss. Let me finish by reminding you that there are also moral laws written in the Bible. This book that many of us read and believe and love and enjoy is the source of the moral laws of the universe and of the whole world. And these laws are written in the Bible. And they are there for the good of all. They are promoted by our conscience. We know it's right to obey them. But they are often broken. And the consequences of breaking the moral laws written in the Bible leads to a chaotic society. Many of you will have noticed has happened in many cases. The choice is ours to obey them or not. And this time, the personal loss of disobeying the laws of God is not just temporary. It affects our being, which is eternal. It affects the consequences that we all must face when we answer to God for whom we have dealt with his laws. I'm sorry to bring bad news to you, but the bad news is guilty. We've all broken the law. You know the basic Ten Commandments law, laws given to Moses, written on stone thousands of years ago, still valid. Nobody will stand up and say, I've never broken any of these laws. Actually, the Bible says if you break one, you're guilty of the law. So the bad news for you tonight at the end of this lecture is we are guilty. We've broken the law. And there are penalties to follow, penalty points. What are the penalty points? Well, here's a couple of verses from the Bible that make the first point. We have all broken the law, says the Bible. We've all sinned. That means broken God's law. We've come short of God's standard, which is perfection. And the penalty points are clear. They're serious. The wages are constantly. And that's not all the news. The real news at the end of this lecture is better. The good news of the gospel is that God, whose laws we've broken, actually loves us and commends his love so much towards us who have broken the law, who are sinners, that he sent Jesus Christ, his son, into the world to die for us, to take our penalty, so that you and I, by faith, can have redemption through Christ's blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. And the Bible says this, that we can be justified, we can be made right with God by faith, and have peace with God through our lives. Number one, Christ took our penalty. He died on the cross, not because he'd got it wrong, not because he'd done wrong, because we had got it wrong, we did it wrong, but Christ looked our sins, can be forgiven. Not just forgotten about, not just ignored. God is just and holy. He's not in the business of just sweeping things under the carpet. God can forgive our sins because Christ died for us. And if by faith we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and trust him to have forgiven us of sins, we can do you think we've got any nearer to the answer to the big question we started with, created or evolved, what does science say? I want you to think about this as well. Laws are important. Everyday laws are important. God's laws are important. And although we've broken them, God has made a way that we can be forgiven and accepted. Not just in this life, but in the life to come. Thanks for listening. May God bless you. We're going to have a cup of tea shortly, but as Christians, we always like to thank God for things like cups of tea. So let's just bow our heads for a minute and give God thanks. Our Father, we do give thanks for all we've been able to think about tonight. And we pray that what's been before us may not just be an interesting topic, but something that will challenge us to think about where we are and what we are and how we need forgiveness and how we need acceptance with Thee. We thank thee too for the blessings of the day, for giving us safety and travel, for bringing us here, for the good health that we have, and now for the food and 
drink that we're going to consume, we thank thee for that as well. And we pray a blessing on each one of us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll do remember what I said at the beginning. If you have anything you want to ask me, I don't promise to have all the answers, but I will try my best to give you some kind of answer. And if you'd rather write a question down for tomorrow or the next night, just do that. Well, let's enjoy a cup of tea, and I hope I haven't put you off. I hope you will come back to at least some of the rest of this series of lectures.